Jonathan, thank you very much. Great pleasure to be here. So let me share you some experience of this global program and the lessons we have learnt and trying to make sure that we can apply in practice for every patient the standard of care that we would like to apply. Now, I think there's no difference really in the international guidelines as to what we are trying to achieve. So I've taken an example from the ESC guideline. So there's immediate rescue of the patient that's admitted to hospital, uh, identifying the life-threatening issues. There then is the introduction of drug therapy. But remember, of course, that in most developed countries, about two-thirds of patients have a chronic history of heart failure already on some drug therapy, but very unlikely to be truly optimized. And then you have about a third, which will be brand new cases, with a lot of work to do in terms of diagnosis, treatment, education. And after that intermediate phase, you're then going on to the phase that Nadia was mentioning, still very high risk for mortality and rehospitalization. But the plan is not that you've done the job by getting the patient out of hospital. The journey has just started, and it's so important to try and continue those actions after discharge. And I do realize that across all the provinces in Canada, you have different issues, but basically not enough people with expertise to make sure that that journey is done efficiently. And it's great to see this meeting and lots of idea sharing about how to drive that forward for the future. But the key issues in terms of pre-discharge and that early vulnerable phase are really quite straightforward. This is not rocket science, and politicians and patients might wonder why we struggle so much to make this happen. So who's seeing the patient, when are they seeing them, and do they have an idea of what they're trying to achieve? And if you don't have that, then you're very unlikely to achieve it. And in most international guidelines, there's realization that you need to formalize this. It's called a disease management program. And I apologize for the North American spelling of program, but I thought I would do that since I'm pretending to, to know the culture. Uh, see a general practitioner uh, within a week of discharge. But of course, does that GP actually know much about heart failure? Do they know what the plan is? Do they feel enabled? and protected enough to start enacting the plan. And then it's certainly the European guidelines say that you should be seeing a cardiologist within two weeks of discharge, but they do say if feasible, recognizing that actually in many countries and many centers, that's almost impossible. Now moving to my country, to England, uh, NICE is very clear about this as well. It recognizes the quality of that evidence. There's no contest about the fact that you need to introduce these drugs. You need to up-titrate them. You need to optimize if your patient's going to benefit. So one of the quality standards in England is that once a patient's discharged from hospital, they should be seen within two weeks by a member of the heart failure team in that local area. They may be community-based, a heart failure nurse specialist, a GP, or they may be the hospital team, but somebody with expertise and who's actually going to do something needs to see the patient within two weeks. Patient groups are very vocal about this, and this is monitored. So let me show you what the situation is actually like. So we've got the theory, the tablets of stone from Moses, from Nice, what's actually happening down in the valley. So this is the reality. It looks complicated, but the message is really very simple. And the youngest age group, that's the top line, age 18 to 44. So these people are lucky enough to survive admission to hospital, sent out, and this is the time to follow up um, by a cardiology service, either specialist nurse in the community or in hospital. And you can see even in that young age group, life-threatening condition, young patient, probably not much comorbidity, only 70% in England actually get any cardiac follow-up. And it takes, on average, about a month for that follow-up to be enacted. So that's a scandal, um, even for the youngest age group. Moving into the older patients, you might argue that they've got more complex needs. Heart failure may not be the only driver of outcome, but you can see there how appalling the follow-up is, despite the national standard. So there's a long way to go in many countries, despite the fact we know what we should be achieving. 
In the USA, of course, very similar. So I've just highlighted there the second red box. You can see that a follow-up visit within 7 to 14 days and or telephone follow-up within three days. And of course, one can use digital technologies, telemonitoring, to enable some of that to happen. And I think in Canada, you're ideally placed to use some of those modern technologies to allow you to reach out to many more patients without having to see them necessarily face to face. Um, but the North American guidelines, same as NICE, same as the ESC, in terms of that vulnerable phase follow-up. So no debate about it. It should be happening. Your challenge is to how do you make it happen, not just for the chosen patients you see, but for the vast number of heart failure patients. So lots of different systems, lots of management consultants, lots of different programs, lots of different fashions in this. I'm sure you've heard of all of these, Total Quality Management, Lean Six Sigma, 4S, Payment by Results, Smart Objectives. We all roll our eyes as clinicians when the new manager arrives with this philosophy, and a lot of them are taken from industry and taken into healthcare. But at least they make the point that unless you think about what you're trying to achieve, you're very unlikely to actually get there. For me, in looking at the evidence and being involved in quality improvement in many different settings, I think the best evidence is a pathway-based approach where you actually look at how the patient flows and who they come in contact with, and every contact has to count. What, who are the people they're seeing? When do they see? What competencies do they have? Do they know what they're trying to achieve? So just very briefly, because I know we're slightly behind time, what is the optimized program? Well, this is not a very formal program where you have to do 26 different things and pay a large licensing fee. This is very flexible, light of foot, a program that can be enacted in any country in the world, and at the moment it's 45 different countries, and some of those have very much less resource than England or Canada put into healthcare, many fewer uh, trained members of staff as well. So what are the components of this? Three different components. First one is actually forcing hospitals to get it right in hospital. So kind of forcing them to say, it doesn't matter if you see the cardiologist or not, if this patient hits your hospital, there should be a protocol that says what should happen at the different stages, and people should feel obliged to deliver this. So these are paper protocols in some places, electronic in others, um, and, but very good to share good practice about what should be happening. And in some countries, absolutely nothing was there, and now... Um, for example, in Indonesia and the Philippines, all of the hospitals in the country have the same protocol for the treatment of heart failure. So it's a good step forward. You probably are already at that stage in all of your hospitals. The second component, and this is one of the really key things for driving up standards, is a checklist. Old-fashioned term, but it's a bit like an airline pilot, a bit like a cardiologist, highly paid, highly intelligent, usually not short of ego, and you're trying to do the same thing each time, but they get a bit bored, so they kind of go off piece quite quickly. So that's why you give them a checklist to make sure that they and their teams know exactly what needs to happen. Now, in some places this is electronic, in other places it's just paper or even a sticker, but it actually just lists the key things that need to be measured, examined, what drugs the patient's on, what the plan is. And there's a list of all of these things pre-discharge, so the plan is set, and then there's a the follow-up panels, two weeks, four weeks, whatever it is thereafter. The key thing in this, it's a record that's kept within the hospital notes, but given to the patient as well. And what's been really pleasing to see is the patient then is a the vehicle for upskilling whoever they come into contact with. So let's examine the scenario. GP sees the patient, oh, you've got heart failure. GP's desperately trying to remember what the modern management of heart failure should look like. Get given this checklist, just by reading through the checklist, which might take two seconds, three seconds, you have upskilled that GP to act and to know what the key information is, as if they've had a lot of training. So actually using the patient and the family to educate, to collect the information, and to make that pathway actually follow them. And this has been really hugely effective in many different settings. The third component is boosting this patient education. And there's a patient passport, very much like what we have for diabetes and pregnancy in many countries. And there's also an app version of this, both Android and Google systems, uh, Apple systems, 
um, which you can download in many different countries. There's a checklist. It's gone through various iterations. It's also in different languages. It's been modified by different countries. So Optimize is not a rigid program. It's something you can take the different components and modify it to what's useful for you. This is a patient passport, all of these different countries, these different languages, and hugely helpful. And um, if you're interested, then Servier in um, Canada can show you some of this material. It'd be great um, if some of this could be adopted uh, nationally or uh, in provinces or even in just individual centers. This is the app as well. And in some countries, of course, people are very literate with their smartphone technology, and in others, of course, this just doesn't fit with what's going on. So at the moment, the program's in 33, actually it's gone up to 45 countries now, some of them listed there, uh, lots of different languages um, for the app as well, so there's lots of resource available. What I've observed, <clears throat> just the last few slides now, what I've observed going around many of these countries and looking at the issues are that the issues are exactly the same in every single country. Patients, diagnosis, treatment plan, and then making sure that treatment plan continues rather than just an acute treatment episode, patients thrown out, no long-term plan, no long-term compliance, no up titration. And the way to do this is what you're doing here, is that you have national awareness, uh, you have guidelines, you have a consistent and coherent plan moving forward. I think having this written down is very helpful. It'd be nice to see what your stretch goals are for heart failure care in your different provinces, what you're trying to achieve in the next 12 or 24 months. I think a lot of countries have used this as an excuse, in a way, to set up registries to find out how their patients are actually doing. And when they do that, it is shocking how poor the outcome for heart failure can be in many countries and in many hospitals. And education, of course. Education, education, education. Physicians, nurses, pharmacists, patients, um, particularly, you can help drive up care. If you're interested, we've published the kind of basic design of the program um, some time ago now, or well, last year. International Journal of Cardiology. Many of these countries now are collecting data on heart failure outcome, and I've encouraged them to present at the big heart failure meetings, and it's so nice to see now the platform is not dominated by English-speaking North Americans and Europeans, but many different countries, Russians, Colombians, Filipinos, etc., because it truly is a global problem. And you've already seen this paper, which just came out in press two weeks ago, International Journal of Cardiology. Post-communist countries, uh, Russian-speaking, for the first time, registries now being set up, optimizing care, and they happen to look in their registry as to what happens to patients who had quite aggressive heart rate control, as in patients, um, versus those that were just given beta blockers. Now, the patients with the aggressive heart rate control, beta blockers and evabradine, whilst inpatients, started off with a higher heart rate. That's why the physicians were using evabradine in addition. And they were actually higher risk patients. But if you then follow them out, despite that higher baseline risk, they actually seem to do substantially better out there to one year's follow-up. And of course, this has really encouraged these Russian-speaking countries to get more international, to get their programs together, and to realize they can collect useful data and drive standards forward. I think in the interest of time, I'll skip the other slides, but we've got data from many countries, Colombia and Brazil, showing actually how horrifying the outcome is for these patients. But when they go into a structured program, the results seem to be very much better. So, Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, I'm here really not to sell the program to you. I just want to help share the experience we've gained in many countries. I think it's very interesting. We had a meeting last night of key heart failure people from all of the provinces. The challenges are obviously slightly different, um, but what we're trying to achieve is quite clear. My challenge to you is to not just talk about it, but to come up with a coherent plan and to see what you are going to do in the next 12 or 24 months to make sure that when I come back, hopefully, um, the results will be very much better than they are currently. Thank you very much.